weird starting without the pizza here. <laughs> here you go, man. How are you? So, I'd, I'd really like to make this as informal as possible. Um, I didn't come prepared with some super formal, fancy presentation. I thought we would really just have a conversation. Um, I work in wealth management. I'm right across the street. I guess we'll start with how many are here because you have to be. Fantastic. So you all want to be here and hear what I got to say? Yes. All right, so we're off to a great start. Uh, so what is just, if I could get, hey, how are you? Um, what is the makeup of the room, like freshman, sophomore, junior, senior? We have a little bit of everything, I think. Yeah. And, and I guess. And grad student, and uh, at least we have two grad students here. Okay. Um, a couple of freshmen, and mostly I'd say juniors. Juniors, yeah. Most okay. People are juniors. Great. I mean, this is the right time to be thinking about it. Um, can somebody give me a little rundown about this group, kind of what brings you here today? I mean, I, I got, is, is Sandra here yet or no? Uh, no, she's coming from an internship. So why don't we have our vice president, uh, Carol, help? Hey, uh, so this is Fidel Psy, the Finance, Accounting, and MIS Honor Society. Uh -huh. um, basically, you have to be in good academic standing to be in the club, to be initiated, and to national organization. So that's right. who we are. Pretty fancy. Yeah, okay. uh, so what types of meetings do you typically have? A firm will come in, we'll talk about the firm, talk about opportunities at the firm, talk about where the industry is going, um, and like sometimes we have uh, speakers come in, we just have one to talk about negotiation skills, mm -hmm. we have another one to like, talk about different types of accounting, like going into like a CIMA position versus a uh, CPA position, mm -hmm. things like that. All right. So I guess what is your, everybody's understanding of wealth management as it is today, like right now? Kind of what's the baseline? Anybody else? Go for it, I guess my general understanding of it comes is that it's more of an advisory position where you generally advise people with your clients on how they best sh how they should best invest their money to find the best returns. Okay. Anybody want to build on that? Well, like uh, the way that they explained to me at like my old wealth management group was it's like financial advising, but it encompasses a lot more. Like with a um, client at a wealth management firm, you're going to talk to that person's whole family, get their whole life plan, talk to their lawyer, talk to their CPA, things like that. Alright. Anybody want to build on that? Okay, so I guess let's start with what is not, right? So if we rewind probably, let's say, seven years ago, seven, ten years ago, it was all portfolio management, okay? So I talked to a client or a prospect at Morgan Stanley, and I'd say, look, let me get a copy of your statement. Um, and then I'd look at the holdings in that statement and be like, oh, no, 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 you know, this is all wrong. You know, you got to sell this, sell this, sell this. How, you know, how could they be charging you this much? And then kind of rebuild the mousetrap on our side, right? And, and highlight why, you know, Merrill Lynch has better access to whatever it is that's going to help get them higher returns. And we were talking to all of our clients in terms of a benchmark, right? So did you beat the Dow? Did you beat the S&P or kind of whatever, you know, whatever, what, whatever arbitrary index we chose was kind of going to be the target that we would be measured against? But that, you know, like when you're measuring yourself against something that you truly can't control, right? We can try to beat an index, but how do we really control that? Um, and then, you know, so we had our advisors really tied to their desks and trying to trade to beat the market. And there was really two problems with that. Um, one is that, you know, we were building this culture of, hey, my value is in that I'm going to get you better returns than the next guy. Um, but then they also weren't out trying to acquire new clients. Because if you're sitting trading, you know, at a desk all day, um, you can't be out meeting with people, talking with people, finding new people to work with. Does that kind of make sense? Right? Um, so then we, we really wanted at Merrill, and our driver, you know, I'd call somebody and say, hey, look, um, I've got this bond you got to buy. And if you don't buy the bond now, kind of this bond is going to be gone, right? So it created this like friction point. 
uh, where the client was almost like forced into action to do something. Um, but you know, created this relationship with the client that if we didn't beat the index, you know, if we didn't beat whatever we set out to do, um, the client would leave. Right? They they viewed our value in returns. So then, let's say five years ago, Merrill Lynch really wanted to change the conversation and have what we call like a goals-based discussion. So sit with a client and really try to make the conversation personal. So we'd say, okay, you know, start the conversation with what does money mean to you? Um, and that's this big like arbitrary, you know, hard to answer. Like if I asked you guys, what does money mean to you? What, what would be some answers? Right, so, right. I mean, you'd say in its simplest form, it's probably helping you pay off some loans, right, that you may or may not have. Maybe you're saving next to try to buy a house or something. Um, and then it's that general day-to-day -day on, let me have some money to do the fun things that I want to do with my friends and family, right? So, it's kind of this driver that gives you the freedom to do the things that are most important to you. So we'd say, okay, for the, for the general person that we're sitting with, um, number one on the list tends to be retirement. So let's say, okay, well, let's talk about that retirement. What does that look and feel like? Um, is that retirement for you in 10 years? Is it 15 years? Is it 20 years? You know, what does that lifestyle in retirement look like? Um, and these are many things that people just haven't thought about. You know, it's like, I don't know. I mean, I could retire when I'm 65, but what would my lifestyle in retirement look like if I wanted to retire at 60? Um, and just that, that process of really what would that lifestyle look like? You know, what are you budgeting for? Um, really starts to open up the discussion. So let's just say generally, um, you know, the, the top three goals of a client would be retire, um, send their kid to FDU, and buy a beach house, right? If we knew the order of importance of those goals, if we knew the timeline associated with them, and we could assign a dollar value, then we could turn around and put a financial plan together for that client. Does that kind of make sense? Right? Um, because we need to know, all right, what does that retirement lifestyle look like? Do you need 100,000 bucks a year, 500,000 bucks a year, or 50? Um, you know, for FDU, what do we anticipate the tuition to be by the time the kid, your kids get there? Um, do you anticipate them getting any fancy scholarship loans? Are they gonna be an athlete? What do you, you know, we don't know. Uh, and then the beach house, you know, maybe the beach house is more important than uh, your FDU education. Um, so those are all things we need to know. So then we put together, so, you know, my last name is Claire, we put together the Claire Family Index. And that's the type of conversation we're having with clients. So we'd say, okay, we've put a financial plan together to help you reach your goals. And let's say we need 8% to reach the Claire Family goals. Now that's, that's what we're planning towards, right? And the S&P and the Dow have been all over the place. Um, and, you know, let's say the S&P does 16%, you know, close to what it did last year. Who cares, right? Because for me to get closer to that return, I have to take on more risk. And what are the things that I'm risking? I'm risking retirement, I'm risking FDU, and I'm risking the beach house. Does that feel like a much more natural conversation than how are you doing versus the S&P? Does that kind of make sense? What, like, is that what you expected the conversation to look and feel like when we started this, or no? Is anybody surprised by that? Give me something. Yeah, I feel like it's more personal than expected. Right? Yeah. Um, you know, so then when we're sitting down and having the conversation, again, who cares what the S&P did? Who cares about the Dow did? What we get to talk about is what are those things that are most important to you? Like, 
how's the job going? You know, like how are you saving? Do you want you do you want me to run a scenario where you retire a little bit longer? Do you want me to run a scenario where you, you know, maybe get a part-time job doing something that you love, right? Um, and it's much more about this personal interaction than numbers on a board that people don't really know what, you know, like what's making them go up and down anyway, right? Um, and we find that less and less the conversation is about the money, you know, and what it's doing, and more and more is what's going on and that's important in your life, right? So let's say, like with FDU, if all of a sudden you turn around and found out that your kid was going to get a scholarship, like how can we redeploy those funds to help you do something else that you love to do? Like can we make the beach house attainable a little bit sooner? We also found out that as we're having these discussions in terms of the things that mean most to them, people are a lot less likely to want to pull money out, right? They're much more likely to stick to the plan, understand, you know, that's, I don't know what the market ended up doing today, but as of yesterday, the last 23 of the last 27 days, it was, you know, triple point swings up and down. So that shakes a lot of people, you know, and in this like portfolio management type of world, we would get a lot of phone calls that said like, sell me out, I want out, right? And the average investor is gonna, you know, uh, buy high and sell low, because they're just kind of riding that emotion. But when we're talking to them in terms of this, what it means most to them, it's a lot less likely to happen because right? we've got a plan, we stick to it, and we're able to talk to them in probabilities to say, hey, look, you know, with 95% confidence, um, we can say you can hit your first two goals, right? If we go down to 80% confidence, we might be able to say, okay, yeah, now that beach house is attainable. Make sense? Um, what are some things that you all want to be sure to get out of this discussion? Because I could talk for an hour easy, but it's really your time here, right? So what are some of the things that you want to hear from me? So I'll just talk. That doesn't bother me. What do you got? Uh, what's some advice that you would give to yourself being a finance student in college? Okay. And what would you do differently? All right. May I uh, also raise a question? Sure. Would you uh, recommend a wealth management major or an accounting or a finance or it doesn't matter? Okay. What else? Um, well, any suggestions for someone who would be looking for work in a field like this in, at this current time? Hangover, some asset allocation. Okay. Probably not, but we can talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> what requirements would Merrill Lynch have for students who are applying to these, applying to these jobs? Cool. Okay. Anything else? All right, I mean, look. Um, Asset, the asset allocation is an easy one, right? It, it, it all depends on you. Um, it, it's a wrong answer for me to sit up here and say this is what you should be invested in. Uh, um, I mean, uh, for example, say the client didn't want a higher than 8% return, mm -hmm. like a 15% return. Mm -hmm. Where would you typically place the asset allocation? Because you know, m most mutual funds probably aren't around that. Yeah, look, it, it's all about how much risk are they willing to take, you know? If they turn around and say, hey, I need consistent 15% returns, that's probably unattainable. And then we have to have a more realistic conversation around what are those financial goals. And I think part, a big part of it is having that honest dialogue with saying, you know, like, hey, look, I want to ride a unicorn to work every day, but I, you just can't, <laughs> right? Um, and if you want to retire with this lifestyle that you can't fund, you can't. And I'd love to say that all the conversations are like, yeah, like we'll buy that beach house and we'll fund that FDU education and like retirement, no problem. You'll travel the world 10 times. But sometimes it's not, right? Um, and I think part of the value of working with a financial advisor is knowing exactly that, right? Like 
you've got the hopes and dreams, you've got the reality, and then you've got somewhere where we could get you in the middle. Um, so, and that's why that asset, asset allocation is tough, right? It's, it's cash flow, it's savings rates, it's expected returns, volatility in the market, um, you know, and, and a hundred other factors that we can't really plan for. Does that all make sense? Cool. All right. So advice as a finance student. So maybe I'll give a little bit of like my background, you know, how I got to where I am today and I guess why I should be sitting up here talking to all of you. Um, so I graduated as a political science major. Uh, political science theory, right? Um, so I did an internship with a financial advisor my senior spring uh, up in Hartford, Connecticut. I went to Trinity College. Um, every Wednesday I'd meet with them and we would talk about the markets in the morning because at that time it was a portfolio manager type of job, right? We would talk about the markets and some trades, trades and trends that he sees. And then inevitably it would be like beers and golf or some weird combo of that, right? And I was like, sign me up. If that's the job, I'm in. Um, so I got out of school with my poli-sci degree and applied to every like financial advisor with Merrill Lynch job I could imagine um, because I saw that and that's what I wanted. Um, I, I applied, I got a uh, couple interviews in the city to be an advisor and like, swear to God, look back, thank God I didn't get it, right? Because at that time I would have failed and I would have failed miserably and I probably would have ended up on some weird other path. Um, because at the time, the support that we put around trainees was very different, right? It was like, hey, Sean, there's a phone, have at it. You know, I'll see you in a month when we have got to do like a business review. Uh, so I got a job right across the street in a role we call operations. So you're in a branch office working with advisors and clients, but really almost like back office stuff, just making sure everything works. Right? Money's coming in and out of accounts, you know, talking to clients all day, working with advisors, helping them solve their problems. But it gave me this opportunity to really learn the business. Um, so one thing that are you know, important within wealth management is just to get the Series 7 and 66. So I did that. And then I actually came back here nights and weekends and I got my MBA. Um, and the whole idea was that in my eyes, education is something that nobody can take away from you, right? So they can take your title, they can take your comp, but if you got the degree, you got it, right? And I was very young in my career, and this whole, like, what's your five-year plan? Like, I still don't know, and that's okay. But I thought that if I, you know, had my MBA, that would open more doors than it would close. So I went back and got it. Um, and I had this kind of pivotal decision after I finished that, um, where I still had kind of my heart and mind set on being an advisor, but I had a much better understanding of like what it took to be successful in that role. Um, and it's, it was scary, right? I was like, I don't have like the friends and family network, and I had some crazy job over the summer where I went door to door asking for money, and I hated it. Um, and I just envisioned that was what cold calling was like. So I went uh, the leadership track. So um, I, you know, now kind of fast forward, I manage our advisor, our, our advisor training program. Uh, so we've got 43 in our training program right now um, at all phases. Um, you know, so I'm happy to get into what that looks and feels like later if anybody has any questions. Um, so like today when I'm hiring people into that role, um, you know, Professor, to your question on the wealth management major, I'm coming from a place of, of a little, um, uh, like I helped create that, that minor that we have at the school right now. Uh, so I would say, yeah, take it, right? Because um, I think it's great. Um, the biggest thing we tried to get students to learn out of that minor was that it's not portfolio management and it's all, can you have a discussion with a person? Can you build trust? Can you ask those open-ended questions? And can you get them sharing the things that they probably haven't even thought about themselves, right? Um, when we started this at the top, we talked about 
like what is an advisor. I think the main piece that you know my interviewees typically miss, um, what was missed in here, is that you have to go out and find those people, right? It's super easy and sexy to be like, yeah, you know, I want to help people with their financial issues. I want to help them sleep at night, and I want to give them this peace of mind. But you got to find them. Uh, and at, at the front of the career, that's very difficult. Um, and that's why it's having that conversation is so important. Because think about it, right? You've got the people that are in your network, um, which are probably a bunch of people like you. Right? How much help is that going to be uh, to hitting your goals? You've got like your the friends and family of your parents um, to have that conversation. Right? That's a tough one because they still see you as that kid. And now you're trying to be like, hey, don't worry, I'm going to manage your life savings. I know exactly what I'm doing. Um, or your other option is to just cold call people. And that one. You're reaching out to people who you have no idea and getting right to it. And saying, hey, are you interested to sitting down and hear what I have to say? And if they say yes, you got to then try to build trust with them very quickly. Because their timeline on wanting to make a move or a change is very different than your timeline to hit your goals. Right? On average, to be successful through the training program, you got to bring in 500000 bucks a month. It's a lot of money. And you got to do that for three years. It's a lot of money, right? Um, so I don't think that there's a direct path to you have to be a wealth management minor or else I'm not going to interview you. But I think anything that you can do that's going to get a leg up, um, that's going to help, right? Because you'll be able to have those, those bigger discussions. Um, you know, I think the people that come in and fail in the interview is one that, you know, like all they talk to me about is, hey, I, I opened up some fake trading account and these are the returns I got and these are some of the trades I've made and I'm investing in Bitcoin and this, like, I don't care about any of that, right? I'm going to teach you the things you need to do and candidly, you, you're all kids, right? So the, the likelihood of somebody giving you your life savings and having you making the investment decisions is probably pretty slim, right? We have a ton of resources at the firm to help you with that, and that's probably part of the reason you would go to a Merrill Lynch, right? Because you have all these resources. So long answer to there's no direct path, but the opportunities that you can take to have those discussions are the right one. Um, any advice? So, you know, I think first is do your research um, and understand is this really the track you want? Um, I get asked a lot, like, what's the failure rate for people that go into the training program? Um, last year we had, I hired 27 people. I had attrition of around 45%. The attrition tends to be um, those that don't pass their tests. And it's like, well, I, I can't do it for you, right? Like, I give you everything you need. Um, you just have to take the test and pass it. And then it tends to be people within that first year that realize, like, look, this is not for me. You know, I'm out having these discussions with people, um, and I feel weird and bad being the person that's always asking people for money. Um, and I'll tell you the biggest, the switch that you got to flip is that you add value and you can help people. And if you truly believe you can help, then it makes you a lot more confident going around people and saying, hey, do you need help? I can help. Let's sit down and have a conversation. That makes sense? All right. Um, so I guess advice would be for you. A job in wealth management is a 20-year-old pretending to be 40 to get money from 60-year-olds. Let that sink in for a second, right? Um, we are looking for clients that have north of $250,000 of investable wealth, right? So that's 
taken out their house, that's taken out you know, their car, that's dollars that they can give you to invest. You know, the typical 20, 30, 40 year old probably doesn't have it. You know, their assets are all tied up doing something. You're looking for people that's got that excess wealth. So you have to be articulate, you have to be confident, you have to know what you're talking about, um, but you, ha you gotta have the brass ones to go up and have that discussion. So my advice to you is go out and start having those discussions, right? Not about wealth management, but it's about getting comfortable talking to people that are way outside your age range and try to keep them engaged in discussion. Because it's easy to be like, oh, you know, what do you do and what did you do last weekend? But that dies real quick. And those are typically the conversations that nobody cares about, right? Um, one thing we train our guys with a lot is, um, the difference in the question of what do you do and why should I work with you, right? So those sound really similar, mm -hmm. but when somebody asks you what do you do, chances are they have a drink in their hand, right? You probably have one too, and they really don't care, right? Because you're at some social function and they're just trying to make conversation and like move on. So just saying something like, um, you know, I'm a financial advisor with Merrill Lynch, it's like, you know, uh, okay, next, what do you do? I'm a nurse, next, what do you do? I'm a CPA, right? So you gotta say something that kind of grabs them with, you know, I manage the wealth of, a, you know, select families in the area. Be like, oh shit, you know, like, let me hear more about that. Um, you know, but the why should I work with you is you're sitting down with the prospect, you're at the table, Let's say they've got five million bucks, you know, and they say, okay, why should I work with you and not UBS? You better have a very good answer for that. One that, high, you know, articulates your value, gets them confident, um, gives them the confidence to give you your money, but also pay the premium that you're about to charge. Because people can go to Charles Schwab, Fidelity, this wealth front, Betterment, and pay like a fraction of what you're about to charge. Go ahead. So what is your answer for that, to try and get people to work with you? Everybody kind of has their own little twist to it. Mm -hmm. I think what's most important is like the elements of it to be, what does that mean for you in the end, right? So, you know, it used to be, you know, I run, I have a very disciplined investment process with, you know, uh, financial planning focused on your long-term goals. But if I said that, you're like, I have, I understand about what a third of that, what you just said, you know? Um, but if you follow up all those statements with, you know, a disciplined investment process and what that means for you is, right? Focused on long-term planning and what that means for you is, right? Um, all centered around your goals and what that means for you is. Now all of a sudden you're like, oh, I get that. And now I feel connected to that statement. We do a lot of that just through role play, right? Um, so it's funny, let's say we did it December most recently. So, you know, 43 people in the program, I grill them to come in with their statement, right? And there's, that's their, their one-liner that they're gonna kinda like mic drop and walk off the stage. So I said, okay, who feels, you know, raise your hand if you feel confident about your statement. And of course, everybody's like, yeah, I got mine. So I said, okay, you know, give me yours, give me yours, give me yours. Then I had them get into groups of three. And we just rotated saying it again and again and again. And I got to hear it from you guys, then we rotated again, oh, I heard from you, we rotated again, I heard from you. So then at the end of the, the, you know, the hour, we said, okay, you know, who still feels confident about their statement? Now it's like a third of the hands are up. You know, it's like, who's gonna go back and change their statement now that we've had, you know, like you've heard how others have said it, and everybody's hands goes up. Because it's, it's one of those things where, like there's very few original ideas, um, and even less, there's very few, like this is exactly how you have to do it. Um, you know, and I'll get into that in a little bit, but I think that's the biggest frustration, because it's so much more art than science. So advice, go out and have conversations with people that are way outside your age range and try to engage them in conversation. What would I do differently? I don't know. I don't know. Like, 
Um, I think leading up to it, I was all, you know, I want to be a financial advisor or I want to be an investment banker, right? And I think the sexiness of jobs right now is, is fading a little bit, but I get a lot of people like, what are you applying to? Is a question I tend to ask a lot of applicants just to see like where their head's at. Um, and it will be investment banking, trading, and then wealth management. It's like, okay, well, why do you think like those three go together and why do you feel that you'd be good at all three of those? You know, be prepped for a question like that um, and say, hey, look, I'm all into wealth management. Here are the three different firms that I'm applying at right now, and this is why I think I'll be successful in that type of job, right? Um, looking for a job. So I think what's most important, you know, we have internships, you know, happy to have discussions. Um, but from like a career perspective, is like, yeah, I'm up here talking about being a financial advisor and you know, I manage the advisor training program, but there's so much more than that, right? Um, we have operational roles where you can come in and learn the business. We have a role called client associate where you work with an advisor within his business, helping support it and grow it. Um, that we have management jobs, we have advisor trainee jobs, right? So it's really, it's almost what is the best entry point for you. Um, if I'm interviewing somebody and they seem like a very sharp and intelligent um, candidate, but it's, it's like, look, financial advisor is just not right for you right now. We're gonna have that honest dialogue and I'm gonna try to connect them with a person that I think would be a better fit um, that's hiring for a role that they would wanna get access into the company. Make sense? Right? Cause the last thing we want to do is lose talent because we kicked him into the deep end um, because then we both lose, right? You have to now restart this whole like job search thing. I've got to restart finding whoever it is that I want to hire. We've got to retrain, you know, like it all just takes time. Um, you know, but from a, I, you know, like if you want to be a financial advisor, if that's your thing, there's a couple buckets of places you can do it. So just super generally, right? You have like the Fidelities and the Charles Schwab's. You have like the insurance, like Mass Mutual, Northwestern Mutual type of places. And then you have kind of big brokers. So the Morgan Stanley's, the UBS's, the Merrill Lynch's. So if we talk about the discount brokers, right? Like right now, they're, they're killing us. Uh, they're growing probably two or three, you know, Charles Schwab is growing two or three times faster than Merrill is right now. Um, because they have a, I think it all comes down to, are you able to articulate your value and then consistently deliver it, right? Um, but in a Charles Schwab <coughs> world, you're going to walk in and they're going to give you a book of business, right? Sounds great. And your job is to dig into that book of business, uncover opportunities, Try to get new money out of that. Could you explain to them what you mean by a book of business? Sure. So that's uh, they'll give you clients that are working at Charles, you know, that have their accounts at Charles Schwab. Make sense? So you'd be the kind of the main touch point or advisor for those clients. Um, let's say you're very successful at that. You know, you love being an advisor, and five years down the road, you want to move to a Morgan Stanley or a, you know Merrill Lynch you would not have the right to solicit those clients to come with you, okay? The, the firm gave you those clients, so the firm owns the clients, you don't. Um, so that, you know, like you'd have to essentially start over. Make sense? Then you have like the insurance brokers, so they all lead with insurance. Um, you know, find that, uh, the gap in coverage that you might have, and then kind of try to spread from there. Um, what you'll be doing is calling family and friends and try to get everybody to do life insurance policies. That'll work for a while, um, but their wealth management platform just isn't that strong. But, you know, they're giving jobs out all over the place. And then you have the Merrill Lynch's, the UBS's, the Morgan Stanley's, who sounds more aggressive than it is, but, like, we don't give you anything. You know, we give you a ton of training, but you have to identify the prospects. You have to close the clients. You define your service model. 
Um, but I think that's why we pay you so much, kind of on the back end side of it. You are truly a business owner under the umbrella of Merrill Lynch, right? So I think that's what allows you to say, you know, okay, I want to work with women entrepreneurs. I want to work with ultra high net worth families. I want to work with retirees, right? Like you define your niche and have at it, right? I, I don't care. Um, it's whatever would work for you and wherever you're having success. Any questions on that? Can you talk a little bit more about how these financial advisors at Merrill Lynch would, like when they're kind of like thrown into the water, would even begin to find a new client if you can't find them from your old firm as much? So just from like a hiring process, what we do is I'd first bring you in and just do like a discovery interview, right? Kind of like everybody else. You get to know me, I get to know you, give you a high level what the process looks and feels like. Um, then we'd have you put together a business plan. And pretty much anybody that comes through, unless they're just like a complete dope, I'm gonna have put a business plan together. Because that's really what it's gonna tell me if you've got the thought process, the access to resources to be successful. Now, like for young candidates, I perfectly understand that you've never put a wealth management business plan together before, right? So we have a template, and you go through, fill the template out. The weird part about it is that it, it's part of the application process. So it's super easy to be like, yeah, you know, all my friends are millionaires, and they've already told me that they're gonna give me all, my, all their money. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably hire you, and then, you know, it'll, you know, the truth will surface pretty quickly, right? Um, but we have you put that business plan together so you can really start to think about it. And the main things we look for are, are who are the centers of influence, right? Who are the people in your life that are going to connect you to other individuals with wealth? Typically for you, it would be, you know, family, like family and close friends. Like those centers of influence, they themselves do not have to be clients. But they're ones that like, they're your number one like supporter, cheerleader. Um, and they're gonna say like, yeah, come on, I'll introduce you to this person, this person, this person, right? If you've got strong relationships um, to people that have access um, to big networks, uh, there's at least a likelihood that you'll get some steam coming straight out of the gates. Um, biggest problems tend to be for people in your seats with centers of influence. Um, first, you haven't talked to them, right? So you haven't said like, hey, are you comfortable introducing me to people in your network? Um, because what you'll find out is either they're not comfortable, like, dude, you've been there two weeks, call me when you've been there a year, right? Um, or they, uh, they have access to this huge network that they're happy to introduce you to, but it's all the wrong type of person, right? It's all, you know, kids coming out of school that got 10 grand to their name. Or you think they have this huge network and they don't. So part of this business plan process we have is like go talk to the people that you can and say like, hey, this is a path I'm seriously considering going down. I view you critical to my success. Are you comfortable making these introductions? And if you are, great. And if not, I'd, I'd rather know now than later, right? Um, we also have you look through and, and identify target markets. So where do you have like a niche market type of thing? Um, there should be a direct tie-in between the center, the, pe the people that your centers of influence can introduce you to and your target markets. So everybody loves doctors, right? They got a ton of money, no time, and no inclination to do it themselves. Um, so the idea would be you have a couple people that are centers of influences that could connect you to doctors. So doctors would be a natural market for you because you've got an in to get into that. Make sense? Right? Um, so, you know, fast forward to a hiring process, we bring you in. Most of your time up front is set, uh, spent studying. Um, uh, for your Series 766, but we're bringing you in all the meetings, talking about the thought process, you're getting access to the resources, you're talking to successful advisors, you're talking to other people in the training program. 
after you finish your tests, we give you five weeks to now really refine that business plan, okay? To start, like, now I'm thinking again of, like, I said I was gonna call Aunt Susie, like, is that really the right person? You know, let me call her now, let me have her start getting that list of people, let me have her start contacting those people. And that's mostly where that initial jump comes out of. Um, but then it's just a grind outside of that, right? Like, who's it within your uh, LinkedIn network? So you can connect to the people that are connected, you know, like that second degree connection thing. You know, like, who are the people that you want to get warm introductions to? You know, like, the people that Aunt Susie didn't even think about as her network, but she knows because she's connected to in LinkedIn. And then it's just cold call. You know, there's, there's no magic to it, right? Um, it's what we're looking for are is money in motion, okay? So people that got, they retired, they got inheritance, they hit the lotto, they just got divorced or something, right? They just got this big chunk of money and they don't know what to do with it. Um, and that's really like right place, right time. You know, like you can't, in, you know, for the most part, you can't anticipate when that's gonna happen. So you just wanna to talk to as many people as you can and let them know what you're doing. And then the other bucket is people that are unhappy with how they're doing it right now or with whom they're doing it right now. So if they're doing it by themselves, let's look at these last 27 days. We've had 23 of triple digit market moves. They could be like, I'm out. You know, like I'm getting my clock cleaned. I'm trying to do this myself. I've got a full time job. This is not my thing. I'm going to pay you to do it. Or they're working with an advisor and it's just they're unhappy. You know, and th these times of volatility are actually fantastic for us because we're out putting ourselves out there. And when you work with somebody for a long time, you tend to get comfortable. So you stop calling them as much. Maybe you don't do that annual review. Maybe you don't return their call right away. And that's where we slip in, right? Um, so that's, a, that's where you get kind of that initial jump. But again, the, there's no science to it, right? Wow, I got 15 minutes. Why don't I open it up for questions? make it a point to say we are not accountants, we do not provide tax advice, okay? But I think there's, a, what you need to think about is one, is your heart truly set on, hey, I want to be an accountant, like tried, true, I want to work for KPMG and do auditing? Because if you do, great, like I think that takes a special person, but go do that. Um, but I think your understanding of numbers, the ability to look at a financial plan and articulate, kind of see the pattern that the numbers are given to you. It's all about can you make something that feels complicated, um, easily digestible and understandable to the person that has no clue what you're talking about. So from an opportunity perspective, um, for straight up accounting, you know, that would be more in our like institutional bank. Um, because in Merrill Lynch, we, we, we straight up say like, hey, we're not accountants. Right. Um, but that doesn't mean we don't hire accountants, right? You gotta think about how can your skills and your knowledge be translatable? Because, look, I'm a poli-sci major and I got hired, you know, they're, they're, they weren't looking for politicians either, right? What else? Uh, so how often do you keep in contact with your clients? So I myself don't have clients. Um, so I manage the advisors that do. Um, I think to answer the question though, it depends, right? So we really try to personalize the client, the, the, the customer experience to the client, okay? Um, we have what we call like a investment personality assessment. So it's this like crazy psychological quiz, like you see those quizzes on Facebook, like what type of superhero are you, right? We have like, what type of investor are you? Um, so we have them fill it out. And what we realize is like, do you wanna be actively engaged in the investment process or no, right? Like, are you paying me to do it or do you wanna be like right there with me and understand why I'm making each decision? Um, and that's a big part of it. 
So if you want to be right there with me, hey, I'll keep you posted. But oftentimes, the relationship will get to a point where they're like, you know, Sean, I trust you. You know, just, just go do what you want to do. Like, I'm paying you for a reason. Um, if you want to be part of every investment decision, probably getting an advisor isn't the best idea for you, right? Because you're, you're going to pay a premium to then have me double check everything with you. Like, might as well just do it yourself, right? And pay a fraction of, you know, what you'd pay for us. So we typically, we charge a percent of assets. Um, you know, so a million bucks, let's say we charge 1%, you know, it's 10,000 bucks a year um, that they're gonna be turning around and paying us. Um, that, that's a lot of money, right? And for me to call you every day and be like, hey, here are the trades I'm making and why, eventually you'd be like, I'm paying you 10 grand. You just do it, right, just do it. Um, but I think what's most important is that we're frequently checking in with what's latest in their life, right? Because I'd love to say the minute something crazy changes that we're the first call that a client makes. But, you know, like, I don't know. Let's say something awful, right? They go to the doctor and they get some crazy terminal disease, right? And they're going to have all these doctor bills. Doubtful. Their first thing is going to be like, I should call my financial advisor, right? They're gonna call their family, their friends, they gotta like absorb what's going on. But if we know, like there's a lot that we can do to help with that, right? Um, so we just have to stay current and in front of our clients um, to see, has there anything in your financial life changed that we should be aware of, all right? Because I think what one thing that's great about being in Merrill is there's almost nothing that we can't do, right? We've got the retail bank with Bank of America, so you want a checking, savings, credit card, car loan, mortgage, whatever, got it, right? We've got Merrill Lynch for your wealth management. We've got Bank of America's business bank, so if you're a business owner, we can bank the business as well. Um, we can do annuities, life insurance, trusts, estates, and then ultra high net worth. So there's very little reason for you as a client to have to go elsewhere. Um, and that's by design, right? Um, so the, we more position ourselves as that family CFO, uncovering that need, and then using the greater firm to help deliver to it, and keep our competitors out of our back pocket. What else? Go for it, man. You're on a roll. So you said like every advisor kind of works on their own. Mm -hmm. Now, now does Merrill Lynch? push specific mutual funds each advisor should use for their clients, or does it differ from each advisor in sectors or whatever their own tendencies are? Yeah, I mean, absolutely do not push. Um, that's how people get in trouble. Um, but I, I guess Merrill advisors, we don't want them actually working alone, okay? Um, we really want to build out teams that are across functional um, uh, competencies like you want somebody that's really good at planning somebody that's really good at investments somebody that's really good at going out and de developing the business somebody that's really good at going out and deepening relationships um, and we also want them to be multi-generational so you think about a client right client 65 years old they want an advisor that has seen it all right so then they turn around and they want an advisor that's 65 years old because they, they've been doing it for 40 years. Sounds great. But now that client is about to retire. And that client could, we did a survey or a, a seminar the other night, there's a 58% chance you're going to live till you're 90. So let's say 30 years in retirement. There's some, some of the biggest financial decisions you'll make in your life are after retirement. So if your advisor is the same age as you, they're thinking of retiring at the same time. And now you've got to have this like, well, oh shit, what do I do, right? Like now I've got to rebuild this relationship. But if we have these multi-generational teams, then the advisor's got somebody that's 10 years younger than them and 10 years younger than them and 10 years younger than them. And this 65-year-old client knows, hey, like I can see what the succession plan is for my account. I know when I trust these people. 
and this team is going to be able to work with me, my kids, my grandkids, my great grandkids. Right? So that's that's the idea, right? Um, and from that that functional competency, if I love planning and you love investments, and you're talking to your clients, you're going to tend to talk to them about investments, right? And I'm going to tend to lean on planning because that's just what we enjoy talking about. But if you and I team together and we're talking to you know our clients together. You get to do what you love, and I get to do what I love, but our clients get a more well-rounded experience. Does that make sense? Right? So that's kind of the, the vibe that we're going for. Well, who forms the teams? Oftentimes, it's the advisors. Mm -hmm. You know, it'll start with, you know, we went out for golf and had a great time, and we've been sitting next to each other. Uh, but we as leadership have a, uh, play a major role in that because we want to make sure there's an ultimate benefit to the client, not just, you know, we're golfing or drinking buddies, so we should team up. So we want to know what is the investment process, what is the client experience going to look like, how do you intend to work with each other's clients, what's the plan for introduction, how are we going to track that, do you have a unified value prop, um, you know, the way you articulate your value to the client, I want to know that you're doing it, kind of, you're saying the same thing. Um, so oftentimes they'll come to us and say, hey, we want a team, and I'm like, no, <laughs> that does not make sense. Um, but other times I'm saying, okay, you're coming to me and saying I'm looking for a team, um, and I'll come to you with five people that I think would be a great fit. You know, or, you know, what I'll tend to do is give them a couple people of who they said this is the type of partner I'm looking for, and then a couple people, of the ones that they said I don't want to work with a person like that, uh, so that those other people are either going to confirm that what they're looking for is the right option, or it's going to introduce to them like a variable that they weren't thinking about with a potential teammate. Two minutes. I want to be respectful of your time. What else? Does anyone in Metro have any? Oh, wow. I got just one more. That's all right. All right. Um, so now, for the advisors, is their income solely off of the asset fee, or is there like a two, like a two and twenty kind of? So there's no two and twenty. Um, what that means is uh, hedge funds will charge twenty percent of the um, uh, profits, and then they'll also charge two percent of what you have under management. It's kind of highway robbery, if you ask me. Um, there's there's a couple ways advisors can get paid. Overwhelmingly, it is uh, what we call from an, an advice perspective. For that advice, they would charge a reoccurring fee, which is a percentage of the assets that we have under management. Um, the other option is where you pay per trade. Um, you know, more and more people are going to that advice model um, where because that really puts the client and the advisor on the same side of the table, right? If, if I'm charging per trade, I as an advisor have a vested interest in getting you to do more trades, right? Because that means I get paid more. Um, if I'm charging you a flat fee, that percent, my actually my vested interest is to get your assets to grow so that I get paid more. And then those individual trades don't matter. Um, I'm more focused on growing the pot you know, and doing what's right for you. Um, there is a base salary component, um, but just like being a waiter, because we kind of, we have to, but overwhelming, like through the training program, you'd have a base salary and you'd get commissions on top of that. Once you graduate out of the training program, it's all commissions. What else? Helpful? Did I just waste your time? Excellent. Um, I got business cards. If anybody wants to talk, I'm happy to talk, answer any questions you have. I'm right across the street. Um, you know, I was in your, shoe, your, your shoes, your seat, not too long ago. Um, it's tough finding your path. You know, it's tough figuring it out. I do not envy the place that you're in. Um, it's don't get discouraged. Don't sell out for money. Like, do what you love, uh, because guess what? My spring break um, 
summer break, Christmas break, spring break, winter break, guess how long those are? Zero days, right? You work a lot and you're gonna work for a long time. So enjoy it, right? Test some things, do some internships, like see what feels right. I could make any job in a job description sound awesome. You know, garbage man, right? Get to be outside, see new places, you know, travel the world, right? <laughs> Sucks. <laughs> you know, so like go out, like read between the lines in that job description um, and really find out if that connects with you. Because if you're doing what you love, chances are you'll be successful. If you're doing it for a paycheck, you'll get sniffed out pretty quick. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.